Our guest speaker this evening is Douglas H. Johnson. Uh, he is a scholar that specializes in the history of Northeast Africa, Sudan, and the Southern Sudan. He was a resource person in the 2003 Sudan Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Negotiations over the three areas of, is it Abye? Abye. Abye, uh, Nuba Mountains, and the Blue Nile, and later a member of the Abye uh, Boundary Commission. He is an author of When Boundaries Become Borders, which was uh, came out in 2010, and The Root Causes of Sudan's Civil Wars, Peace or Truce, which came out in 2011, as well as a um, writing numerous articles uh, on the subject of the Sudan area. Uh, Mr. Johnson is currently a visiting scholar at Haverford College in Haverford, Pennsylvania, and he will be speaking to us this evening on oil, people, and the border conflict between Sudan and South Sudan. Please join me in welcoming Douglas Johnson. Thank you. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I was asked to speak about borders, so I brought a number of maps. Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, because you can't see the maps that I've got here, and I can't put up all of my maps, but you do have photocopies. And so what we're going to attempt to do is as I speak, I might point to a point place on the map, and then you can look at your copies and have a better view of them than you can hear have here, or in fact a better view than I have. Okay? Now <clears throat> As you probably all know, last year, South Sudan became an independent nation. This was after 22 years of a civil war, which was brought to an end after some three or four years, of three years of peace negotiations in 2005. And the peace treaty or the peace agreement between the two um, groups between the government of uh, Sudan in Khartoum and the Sudan People's Liberation Movement allocated a six-year interim period in which the areas that had been under civil war had been affected by civil war we were supposed to be revived, the economy revived, revenue sharing between uh, the Khartoum and a new government in Juba as well as various other uh, provisions for power sharing. Uh, at the end of that period, there was supposed to be a referendum which would decide once and for all whether the people of South Sudan would decide to remain part of Sudan, a country that became independent in 1956, or become independent on their own. And they chose overwhelmingly in a vote that has in fact been confirmed as being very largely free and fair. They chose overwhelmingly to become independent. Now in some ways this is, uh, in fact in many ways, this is a unique occurrence in the history of decolonization of Africa. If you look at the way in which most African countries became independent, it between from the colonial powers was through negotiation between uh, a nationalist elite to whom power was transferred. South Sudan is one of the few countries in Africa that has become independent by the expressed will of their people. Um, I'd like to perhaps uh, paraphrase or slightly tidy up the words of um, Vice President Biden to say that this was a big effing deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go on about that, but there are a number of post-independence issues that remain unresolved. And in March this year, after a series of skirmishes along the new international border, the army of the Sudan People's Liberation Army, which is the army of South Sudan, uh, crossed what was thought to be a border, attacked an oil town called Hidvich, occupied it for several days. You won't find it on many of the maps, but I'll just say that it is somewhere around here. 
and I'll explain to you why I can only say some words. This caused a huge international uproar. There were very loud denunciations from the Security Council, from the United States government, from the AU, uh, from uh, the EU, from various countries, uh, denouncing this action of South Sudan in invading the territory of their neighbor. I started getting phone calls from various journalists, first from the BBC, then journalists elsewhere, and finally from somebody in the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office asking me, because I'm supposed to know, where is Hitchlidge, and is it part of Sudan, or is it part of South Sudan? When I finally got this call from the email from somebody in the FCO, I decided I'd better write down what I knew to explain why there is a genuine dispute over the ownership of the area. <clears throat> and why it is not a cut and dried matter to say that South Sudan had invaded Sudan. And I put this, I do not blog, I don't know how to blog, I don't have a web page, I put this in a PDF file which I do not know how to make, and mm -hmm. sent it as an email to a variety of people who then sent it and made it go viral and it was put on various websites. And the person from the FCO did say to me eventually, perhaps we were premature in our reaction to no. this event. Right. Now, <clears throat> What was at Hitchlidge? And is it called Hitchlidge? Hitchlidge is just an Arabic term for a type of tree, which is common in Sudan. Uh, its Latin name is uh, Balanites Egyptiaca, if any of you would like to know that. Arabic is called Hitchlidge. In Dinka, it is called Tal. And the area that uh, it was being fought over is known in uh, some Dinka communities, the Dinka being a group of South Sudanese who live in this border region. Uh, it, uh, Pantau uh, is the area, what they call it, and Pantau just means the place of the Hitler tree. It is also the site of an oil field. Uh, and one of the few oil fields that has, was, although the location is disputed, <clears throat> it was an oil field that was not included in the revenue sharing provisions of the peace agreement that was reached in 2005. That peace agreement designated the distribution of oil revenues between the government in Khartoum and the government in Juba. Now, why was this important? Now, um, you will have another map which I'm pointing to here, which you cannot see if you're looking from the back. But this is the map of the known oil blocks at, in 2002. 2002 being the year in which the negotiations began, the peace negotiations began. And again, it will be difficult to, for you to see my little tracer, but if you look at these oil blocks. These are not necessarily areas of active oil fields, but they are the areas where oil is known or suspected to be, and these are the areas that are being explored and where drill, drilling is going on and where a number of oil fields have been located and are active. But if you look, there is a dotted line that goes around the middle trying to show it with this little thing, and of course, most of you can't see what I'm showing, but if you see this little dotted line, that is the international boundary. That is the new international boundary. And as you can see, the majority of oil fields, or the majority of oil blocks, rest in South Sudan, which is now an independent country. During the war, through collaboration with China and with various international oil companies, mainly from Canada, but also from Sweden, with investments from India, Malaysia, Belarus, Qatar, the government in Khartoum was able to begin the development 
of some of these oil fields right on the border area, right on the border area between what is now South Sudan and Sudan, and here, and towards the end of the war in the 1990s, began exporting oil and using the oil revenues to build up their military armaments for fighting the war. Now, what, how were they able to do this if these were, if these oil fields were in South Sudan in areas that were either under the control of the SPLA or uh, supporting the SPLA? I'll come to that a little bit later. All of that oil revenue was being used by the government in Khartoum, either for investments in the north or for the improvement of bringing in weapons and arms, mainly from China. The Comprehensive Peace Agreement that began in 2005 divided the oil revenues. Whereas before, Khartoum was getting all of the revenues during the six year interim period, the revenues of the oil fields inside South Sudan, and that's an important distinction, were divided 50-50, so that the government in Juba got 50% of the oil revenues and Khartoum got the other 50%. With the secession, or with the independence of South Sudan, all oil revenues coming out of the oil fields in South Sudan, all of those revenues go to the government in Juba. There were problems, however, over the issue of transit fees. Now, I'm not an oil lawyer, and I don't really understand the oil business intimately, but <clears throat> certainly if you look at thing, uh, certain, uh, of, uh, what has been happening in Europe with the uh, transporting of natural gas from Russia into Europe, uh, this pipeline goes through several countries. The only way that South Sudan can get its oil exported is along this red line, this pipeline. There is another one that starts here and joins that. And there was a dispute over how much South Sudan should pay Sudan for transit fees. There was a dispute over how much oil Sudan was allegedly siphoning off, and earlier this year, South Sudan not being able to resolve this, turned off the taps. Now, for many people, this seemed to be self-defeating because most of the revenue of South Sudan depends on its oil money. The government depends for its support on the oil revenues. And it was seen by many to be defeating, although there was an acknowledgement that South Sudan was not getting the full revenue that what they were um, due for the sale of what was now recognized by to be their oil. And there was no agreement with Khartoum over the issues of transit fees or various other things. So South Sudan turned off the taps. Now, they probably miscalculated, they probably thought that this would be resolved very soon. In fact, there's only just been an agreement brokered, mediated in Addis Ababa uh, earlier uh, last month, uh, and the oil is not likely to start flowing again until uh, later this year. But, this is where Hitchlidge comes in, because that was a field that had not been allocated to be part of South Sudan, so it was still pumping oil out through the pipeline, and all of the revenue of Hitchlidge was accruing to the government in Khartoum. Somebody is going to have to keep time and make sure that I don't keep on talking, so is that be that you? So you just go, give me a warning, perhaps like that, before you give me the explanation. <laughs> <coughs> um, now, uh, uh, the, the reason why there was this fighting on the border, uh, why there was this sudden incursion uh, but from one side to the other, is that since uh, the independence of South Sudan, and even before 
the independence, the formal independence of South Sudan in July last year, there has been a certain amount of tension on the border and military movements and fighting. The reason why that has been happening goes back 20 to 25 years or more. Although it has always been presented in diplomatic terms and you may recall in any general, general newspaper articles you've read, there's always been a way in which this has been described as a war between the Arab and Muslim North and the Christian and African South. But in fact, the war was more complicated than that. Because when the war began in 1983, although the major players came from South Sudan, and most of the guerrilla fighters came, were recruited from South Sudan, the program of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, and notice that they chose the term Sudan people, not South Sudan, not Southern Sudan, they chose the, to call themselves the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, and their program was to reform the government and the political structure of the country as a whole. Their claim was that there was a maladministration in the center, that political power and economic power for the whole country had to be reformed and um, redistributed. Now, there might be a question about how much the leaders of the SPLM really believed in that, but by presenting that as their platform, they were able to pre present a critique of the way in which Sudan had been governed since 1956 and point out that there were other areas, not just the area of South Sudan, but other areas that had been marginalized either politically or economically since independence. And while these areas might not be Arab, many of them were Muslim, and many of them were against the advancing political agenda of many of the governments in Khartoum to establish a very strict um, Islamic state. And so they were able to recruit people outside of the South from other areas of Sudan who felt the same grievances, especially in areas along the border, in an area known as the Dimbu Mountains, which you may have heard of, made famous by the photographs of Lenny Revenstahl, or the area of Blue Nile, which is there on the border with Ethiopia. Those are areas, as well as many other areas, along the border with, between Sudan and South Sudan, where you've seen since the 1970s the expansion of government leased mechanized army. Now this was a project that started in the 70s of the idea that with Western technology and Arab Gulf money, Sudan could expand its production of agricultural products and become the breadbasket of the Middle East. It ended up, in fact, uh, nearly bankrupting the Sudan. This is why Sudan has such a huge debt. But one of the other problems to consider is that if you look at a map of Sudan, and this isn't a full one, but you will see that Sudan, before the independence of South Sudan, was about a million square miles. It was the largest territory in Africa. Uh, in the very far north, it is desert with low rainfall. And the rainfall increases as you go further south so that you have movements of people, of people who own cattle or sheep or whatever, who follow the rain and follow the grazing areas uh, going southwards uh, during the uh, dry season and then going back north in the rainy season. So you have people who are dependent on access to the, uh, the, not so much the agricultural land, but the grazing areas, which really are along this border area, both north and south of it. In the 1970s, what the government did 
through a progression of laws from the 70s into the 90s, different governments, but with the same intention, transferred the ownership of this land from communal use to government ownership. So that people who have been living in areas and cultivating, maybe by subsistence farming or by pastoral activities, found that land they had used for generations had now been taken out of their control and into the control of the government, leased to entrepreneurs uh, to bring in uh, mechanized uh, farming, agri mechanized agriculture, but then you had new laws about laws of trespass. So that people who used to pass through these areas with their cattle on an annual basis found that they could be arrested and fined for trespassing on these government these projects. People who had been subsistence farmers now could only farm the land that they had farmed for generations as wage laborers. Uh, so this was part of the dispossession of the citizenry of this area uh, that led to uh, a number of economic and political grievances which were then complicated by issues of the Islamic State and issues of a hardening racial politics in Sudan. Now, we in the United States and also in Europe think of race quite literally in terms of black and white. In Sudan, I would like to say that race is a matter, it's a state of mind. Because many people from outside Sudan will look at somebody who claims to be an Arab, and that person is very dark. But it is through the ideas of what constitutes um, uh, descent, what constitutes um, preferred uh, lineages uh, that some people claim to be Arabs uh, and claim that other people who may be the same color as them uh, to be African. And the common term that is used in Sudan for people who are not Arabs is Abd, which means slave. Okay. Now, if you talk to South Sudanese, they will say, we're not the slaves. We've always been free. Look at our northern brothers. See how dark they are. They're the descendants of slaves because there has been quite a bit of mixing. But that mixing is not necessarily through the institution of slavery. That's another topic that I think I won't try to digress to, but it is an important part of why there was a recruiting, uh, recruitment from this area. Now, before, after South Sudan voted for independence in June of January 2011, but before they was formally independent in July 2011, fighting broke out here. Because these areas of the Nuba Mountains, uh, of <clears throat> Blue Nile, and of this area called Abye, uh, which were not included in the South, and were therefore not included in these provisions for a referendum for power sharing, <clears throat> but still had large contingents of people who were either in the SPLM as a political movement or in the SPLA as an army, uh, they were, they, they, there was no provision for resolving their grievances and the Sudanese army first occupied Abia um, and then attacked the areas here in Nuba Mountains in June of 2011 and in September of 2011 attacked the areas in Blue Nile. So part of the problem of this border is that uh, the, it, it cuts across areas of political, where there are political issues, now, <clears throat> but it doesn't help to resolve them. Now, I want to use as an example, and I'm not quite sure how much time I have. Okay. This is the example of the Abia area. And there is a map here, and I will point out places, and I hope you can follow either on this big map or the small maps. <clears throat> 
Now, the Abbey area is distinctive because a group of the Dinka people, now the Dinka are a very well-known South Sudanese group. Uh, physically, many of them are very tall. Manute Bowl, for instance, the basketball player, was a Dinka. There have been many other basketball players that have come from South Sudan from different Dinka groups. They're very dark. They also keep cattle. And they occupied an area uh, along this river. Now, the river has several names, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, we will call it the Bahal Aram, because that's the name that appears on maps. But many local people will call it the Kir. This is a very well-watered area. If you're able to look at the small map, you can see how many small rivers, seasonal rivers, seasonal waterways, feed into the Bahal Aram. It is very important, therefore, for people who are living off their cattle. It's very important for these cattle-keeping, Arabic-speaking Muslim nomads, who are called Bagara. Bagara just is Arabic for cattle. So one way of translating Bagara is just to say cowboys. It is very important for the Bagara for to move their cattle down to this area uh, to graze during the dry season. And they have done this through arrangements with local Dinka for decades. And it was managed during the period of the Anglo-Egyptian condominium, and it was managed for many years after independence. But when the people in this area began to agitate, to campaign, they are part of a province called Kordofan, now called South Kordofan, which is a part of North Sudan. And when they began agitating to be allowed to vote whether they should, could join South Sudan or the southern region as it was in the 70s, um, there was quite a lot of anxiety among the Masiriya, the Bagara cattle keepers, that they might lose access to this area that was extremely important to them. So in fact, whereas the Civil War con conventionally is said to have started in May 1983, you had fighting in this area uh, much earlier than that. Sort of the precursor, the bleeding Kansas of Sudan that preceded the full-blown Civil War. There was a special provision in the, in the peace agreement on how the ABA issue was to be resolved. And it was to be resolved by a referendum to take place simultaneously with the southern referendum, whereby the North Dinka and other Sudanese residents would vote to decide whether to remain where they were, under the jurisdiction of Korda, South Kordofan province state, or to join South Sudan. The problem with that provision in the CPA is that while it described in detail how this was to be done, it did not define the territory that was going to be voted on. It said that the people within this area would vote, but it did not define the territory, so there was no way of knowing who would have the right to vote and what was going to be either left in Sudan or taken to South Sudan. And that was left to a boundary commission on which I served in 2005. I won't go into all of the problems of that boundary commission, but part of our, what we were told to do was to decide what had been the area of this group of North Dinka. What had been the area transferred to Kordofan province in 1905? Exactly a hundred years earlier when there were no maps, very few administrative records, and nobody left alive who was or had been there at the time to tell us what was there. Okay. Now, this line here is the area that the, we, as the Abney Boundaries Commission, decided covered the area that had either been the area of the permanent residence, the permanent habitations of the North Dinka 
a hundred years before, or the areas that they had been regularly using. Now, there are some problems with this, of course. First of all, in this area, uh, and then in this area, if you look at a map, you will find places, a, 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 an official map of the Sudan Survey Department, you'll find some places that have Arabic names as well as Dinka names. Um, so that there, it is a place that's been used by both people. It's very difficult to determine who owns what. Uh, it was really an issue, however, to be separated uh, because uh, it had already been put in the peace agreement that wherever this area was going to be administratively, the people who had been using it, who had had customary access to it for the grazing of the cattle, would not be, that their rights would be retained. So there were two separate issues, but those two separate issues were never adequately addressed as separate issues. Uh, the other problem is that if you look at the map of the oil concessions, uh, you will see that it crosses the area of and that there are, in fact, some active oil fields in the RBA area. And if this area was going to be transferred to South Sudan, then the revenue from those wells would be taken away from Khartoum. And if the area remained in uh, Port of Fountain State, then the revenue would not be shared with the South. Okay? So, Khartoum immediately rejected the findings of the Abia Boundaries Commission. It was sent to The Hague for the Court of Permanent Arbitration. Uh, the uh, Court of Permanent Arbitration redefined the area as this. By the way, this green hatching was what the government of Sudan Khartoum said was uh, the only area of Abia that they were willing to uh, concede to the South. Okay. Now, uh, this was supposed to be demarcated. That was the area that was being under consideration for a referendum. The demarcation never took place because the Sudanese army prevented any surveys taking place there. Um, the referendum never took place. Uh, and unfortunately, you had uh, the US uh, Special Envoy, um, General Gration, uh, kept on putting on the table various proposals that would whittle away this area and, and allocate more and more of that area uh, to uh, the Miseria, to the Sudanese government. So this is why the referendum took, never took place and in May of 2011 it was occupied by the Sudanese army. Now, <clears throat> why is there a problem to determine where these places are? Who owns them or who that belongs. If you look at this map, and this will be the very last time I refer to it, you will see a little place that has two names. Um, and I'm not actually sure that it belongs uh, where it is put, but that is a place that is called Hijlik, but also Madin. Uh, that might or might not be the location of the Hijlik oil field. You put that down. And this one. Now, <clears throat> this is um, a composite of the maps that were produced under the British administration of the area that is under discussion. And you'll see that it has straight lines like that. That is the boundary that was fixed in 1931 when a group of Dinka called Rouen were transferred from Kordofan to Upper Nile. This map, these maps were printed in 1937 and they've never been updated. Okay. These are the most detailed maps that anybody has to use for determining where the old provincial boundaries were and where they run. And you can see from this map that these very clear straight lines appear to be running through empty spaces. Now, you will see in various places 
little words, sometimes a little tree is drawn on the map, and that will say Hinchlich, or Clump of Hinchlich. Mm. And all over the place, there are little Hinchlich forests. <laughs> so, where the hell is Hinchlich? <laughs> where the hell is Panthal? You won't find it on these maps, and some Diplomats, European diplomats, have taken this to mean that there never was a place called Hinchlich, and therefore it has no, there is no question about where he is, it's really in court of hand. Now, the, one of the problems that we're now facing on border demarcation is that the maps are beginning to be taken as the main things to be discussed. That the maps are being, what are being, the focus is on the maps and on the reality of the maps. The maps are merely guidelines. If you go to England, go to Britain, you will find this series of ordnance survey maps. Some of the most detailed maps that anybody has ever produced. I have never seen a map for any part covered by the ordnance survey where somebody in that local area says, that's wrong. That name shouldn't be there, it should be there. We don't use that name locally. So even some of the most detailed and up-to-date maps will have, um, will have disputes embedded in them. Um, the other problem is that what do these straight lines really represent? If you go back to the records, you will see that the description of the transfer of a territory of a group of people is then described in part by maps, but in part by uh, locations on the maps. And whereas you will see on this that this is now supposed to be the international boundary, and it's all straight lines, that in 1931, when the district commissioner was describing how this area had been added to his district, he talked about it in crescents, of making a semicircle, in curved lines. And also, what does this mean on the ground? Because you would have, as you think you can now put that down, you have on the ground people who were appointed as chiefs within local administration, who were also uh, taxed, uh, the, the, they would know what administration, what province they were referring to, what taxes they paid to. And the lines on the map might have borne little relation to where people were, especially people who move on a seasonal basis. And that has not been taken into consideration in trying to resolve the border issue between North Sudan and South Sudan. This is the map that has been produced by the African Union. It doesn't, in fact, follow the 1956 provincial boundaries. It is only a map to show a proposed demilitarized zone that the Sudan Armed Forces and the SPLA are supposed to withdraw their forces to beyond these colored lines while the demarcation of the border is later sorted out. This has recently been agreed between the two sides. We will see what follows. But there has been no agreement for any international mediation in the disputes north of the border, in the Nuba Mountains, in the Blue Nile. And now some of those disputes are linking up with Darfur. Some of the groups in the Nuba Mountains are linking up with the groups in Darfur. And there are other areas of within Sudan where there are discontent which might also become part of an armed insurgency. So <clears throat> I probably presented something that is extremely confusing, but I have no idea how it is going to be resolved. Uh, my only feeling is that if it is the attempt is to resolve it by superimposing lines from the maps onto the ground, it will remain disputed and unresolved. Thank you very much.